Welcome back to Steve's World of Wonders. Let's head into Freak Lunchbox. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Where's that from? It's an Oompa Loompa. Huge lollipop up there. ceiling. Why? That's the question. Freak Lunchbox is a chain of stores, and if you uh, click the link that I'm putting in the corner here on the video, um, you'll see a similar store in um, Newfoundland, St. John's, Newfoundland. There's another Freak Lunchbox location there. of novelties and candies, all sorts of great stuff in this place. Mustard soda, doesn't that sound appetizing? I bought a pack of these uh, super awesome cards. Lots of neat stuff to look at, including hand-painted signs, sideshow circus signs, all on the bottom of the bulk candy here, swords follower. Looks like this used to be an arcade because it's got the old entry here. Uh, 
12 o'clock. There's a sign for Maud Lewis in this gallery. Oh, it's the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. AGNS, Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. Maud Kathleen Lewis was a Canadian folk artist from Nova Scotia. Lewis lived most of her life in poverty in a small house in Marshalltown, Nova Scotia, achieving national recognition in 1964 and 1965. Several books, plays and films have since been produced about her. Lewis remains one of Canada's best known folk artists. Her works and the restored Maud Lewis house are displayed here in the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. Maud Lewis lived from 1903 to 1970. The Painted House Perhaps Maud Lewis's greatest work was her home. She painted almost every surface of the interior, including the stove, the windows, and the door, both sides of the door, with flowers and birds. Dust pans, bread boxes, trays, cookie tins, all were transformed by Maud's brush from everyday kitchenware to decorated objects. And this is her actual house here preserved in the museum for people for generations to see. Maud Lewis was born with birth defects and ultimately developed rheumatoid arthritis, which reduced her mobility, especially in her hands. She was introduced to art by her mother who instructed her in the making of watercolor Christmas cards to sell. She began her artistic career by selling hand-drawn, painted Christmas cards. And the interior has been kept exactly as it was when Maud Lewis was living in here with her husband uh, Everett. You can see the walls are decorated. That's her little work area there. Even the bread boxes are decorated. There she is there, proudly showing off one of her paintings, folk art.
I really like the colors. Everything's nice and bright and crisp. Painting of Maude Lewis. The emergence and popularity of Maude's paintings perhaps mark the beginning of national and international awareness of Nova Scotia's rich folk art tradition. Typical of some folk artists, Maude had no training in the visual arts and painted for the joy of adding color and fun to a quiet rural, rural life. Her favorite subjects included flowers, cats, colorful teams of oxen, sleigh rides, birds, and deer painted onto small pieces of pulp board, often with irregular measurements. Early on, Maud painted with whatever materials could be obtained close at hand. Oil-based house paint, boat paint, and cheap lobby br uh, hobby brushes. The resulting paintings were sold from her home for as little as $2.50. Some were also available at a local store, and as her popularity grew, requests came in the mail. Prices rose to $5. Gradually, her materials improved uh, to include artist-quality oil paints and brushes provided by attentive friends and patrons. She also painted holiday cards in watercolor, which Everett would sell from his wagon as he made fish deliveries. Painted shells and beach stones were also popular for sale to tourists. Although she was not a formally trained artist, Maud's work demonstrates that she had a strong sense of composition, likely, likely acquired through close observation, observation of the casual visual material that came her way, including postcards, calendars, and magazines. Her early paintings and watercolors exhibit an abundance of detail, often touched with humor, and depict iconic scenes of rural life in Nor Nova Scotia. Her later works tend to be more simplified, the combination of a decrease in the mobility of her hands and an increase in the demand for her work forced a paring down of the early complex designs to ones that could be produced quickly and with fewer fine brush strokes. When she constructed an image that she particularly liked, such as the pair of oxen in winter or summer, she would make va many variations on that theme. There's a folk art gallery on the second level. These sculpted glass mushrooms are really cool. Fungal specimens. To uh, keep track of the different kinds, they would make these sculptures, different varieties. 
in an upcoming video I'm gonna show more of those at the uh, at, a, at a smaller museum this uh, this section was really cool these were all they're actually really beautiful paintings or uh, pieces of art um, from people on the uh, autistic spectrum um, they had a I think they had a program with the uh, art gallery where they would come in and make those pieces. Salvador Dali was born in Figueres, Spain on May 11, 1904 to father Salvador Dali Icusi, a middle-class lawyer and notary, and mother Filipa Domenech Ferris, both of whom were avid supporters of his artistic development. Dali began his formal education at Escuela Publica in Figueres, Spain, and was soon transferred to a public private school where all classes were taught in French. After much persuasion, Dali eventually granted, was eventually granted permission by his father to apply for the San Fernando Academy of Art in Madrid, where he began studying in 1922. It was here that he met fellow students Federico Garcia Lorca Louis Br and Louis Buñuel. He collaborated with the latter in his career. Dali quickly began exhibiting work in galleries in Barcelona and Madrid and experienced success in Spain. In 1926, he was dismissed from the academy due to his tendency to challenge the school's authority and instigating other students to do so as well. 
Dali continued to exhibit through Spain using provocative imagery, resulting in exclusion of his work from many galleries in Madrid and Barcelona. In 1929, Dali collaborated with Brunuel to create Un Chien Andalou, an Andalusian dog, a short film that received enthusiastic acclaim from the European avant-garde, including the surrealists who welcomed Buñuel and Dali to the group. It was through this group that he met Gala, born as Elena Dimitrivina Diacona, whom he moved to Paris with in 1929 and married in a civil ceremony five years later. Dali's relatively apolitical views were not so much aligned with the communist and social political ideals of many in the surrealistic movement, isolating himself from the group at a time of extreme circumstances throughout the Spanish Civil War and the Second World War. By 1939, Dali left the surrealist movement and remained an independent artist throughout the rest of his life. With the threat of Nazi occupation of France looming, Dalla and Galli fled to the United States where his work was well, re well received by American collectors. After World War II, Dalla began exploring ideas of physics, painting in the style that he coined nuclear mysticism, polarizing scientific and mystical philos philosophies in search of proof for a divine power. This stage of his career was also heavily influenced by an interest in classical Italian Renaissance that became more evident throughout his work. In the final decades of his life, Dali painted less and less and was able to witness enthusiastic international recognition of his work, including the opening of two museums dedicated to his work, the Salvador Dali Museum in Cleveland, Ohio, now in St. Petersburg, Florida, and his own Teatro Museo in Figuera, Spain. Dali died and was buried in 1989 in his hometown of Figueres, Spain. Salvador Dali, a suite of prints, includes all 11 engravings from Salvador Dali's Our Historical Heritage Suite, 1975. This work has been eclipsed by his earlier widely acclaimed surrealist paintings that he is famous for, uncovering a link between Dali's highly symbolic surrealist work and his exploration on religious themes that recurred throughout his career. This series reveals a, this series reveals a side of Dali's practice that was influenced by classical Italian Renaissance and his renewed dedication to the Catholic Church. These prints offer a rare glimpse of Dali's sparsely produced work from the last two decades of his life and reveal the depth and diversity of his artistic approach. This has been Steve's World of Wonders. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Facts, this has been Steve's World of Wonders. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.